Hello, I'm Jeff Johnston. Welcome to the Living Undeterred podcast. I am super excited today for our guest. Uh, Daniel Gomez is our guest today. And uh, what I've been trying to do with this uh, project I'm on, the Living Undeterred Mindset, is to meet people who are inspirational, who are making a difference. And I think um, in the short amount of time I've been able to know Dan, uh, primarily on um, LinkedIn, social media, I've been very impressed with what he is doing in regards to keeping people motivated, uh, inspirational. He's a keynote speaker. He has an awesome book I'm going to have him talk about that came out a few years back. And um, hopefully together him and I can navigate and help people that are really struggling right now. It seems like these are tough times, Daniel. And uh, if you look at the numbers for mental health, suicide, alcoholism, addiction, they're through the roof. And so I think what you and I are doing, at least today I hope, is that by somebody catching us talking, maybe we can help them get through some tough times today. So with that, I want to introduce Daniel Gomez as our featured guest on the Living Undeterred podcast. Welcome, Daniel. Hey, Jeff. Well, thank you for having me, man. It's an honor to be here. and This subject is dear to my heart. I myself, I tried to commit suicide when I was 18 years old. It's not something that I really ever talked about, but I believe in giving value. And then four years ago, I had another major accident in life where my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. But it was a blessing in disguise, and I can tell you that because of that, I've been able to just speak worldwide and share my message and really bring hope, inspiration, and just truth. So many times we, uh, we only deal with things at surface levels, and we wonder why things don't get better. Well, it, it's, I think we're in a season of, of, of living in this planet that we have to go deeper to really go and find the solutions that are there for us right now, Jeff. Yeah, and some of the things I'm finding out, and my, my project's only been out since about January, but I think I told you in our, um, our pre-interview conversation we had that I lost my son on October 4th, 2016 to a heroin overdose, and he was 23 years old, yet uh, heroin took his life, but that wasn't who he was. That's kind of how I've learn to deal with this and to absorb his story into into my story now and the thing the thing was daniel was he battled addiction since he was 15 and seth was prescribed adderall to combat or to offset his add which i have add and so do you probably <laughs> most <laughs> successful most successful people have some element of add or he wouldn't be here um, but unfortunately for my son, when he was diagnosed by his doctor that he had ADD, Seth didn't really take that as a good thing. And so he started medicating with alcohol, marijuana, he went to cocaine, and then he had some other issues, some legal problems. And then when he got out of prison, he was introduced to heroin. And that's how it ended for him, Daniel. So I'm trying to change the stigma, you know, rewire the narrative. And to get us to keep talking about these things, as you said, at the foundation level. So then we can build up from that. And I know you are an inspired man. You talk, you talk a lot about inspiration. And I think one thing I want to find out today is where do you get your inspiration from? You tried to commit suicide. That's a tough thing to talk about, and I admire you for that. Um, but where did you find your inspiration to get out of that and to... You know, do what you're doing right now as a motivational keynote speaker, podcast of the year, all these things you're doing, which are a true tribute to resiliency and living undeterred. I mean, where does this come from? Well, I think I think just growing up in life and coming out of suicide when I was a senior in high school, looking in the mirror, I didn't like who I was. I had this big old scar that went from the top of my abdominal to the bottom of my midsection, and it just it was. I was kind of mad at myself, to be honest with you. And then 26 years old came around, and my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And he, they gave him a month to live. By, by the grace of God, he lived a, a whole year. And I think at that moment, when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, that's when I really opened up my heart to God and accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that is what my source of inspiration is. You know, I, I found it as a, at a young age of 26, where I really lived it, and then. You know, like you know, we go through those seasons where we kind of stray away, have one foot in, one foot out, and mm -hmm. he he called the prodigal son home. So, the the inspiration comes from God. But I, I'll tell you, just with the way you opened up, it breaks my heart because 
doctors are quick to put a band-aid on things mm -hmm. and i think the world is used to that we're so used to putting band-aids on everything and just to get us to the next stage or the next season and it's like no you got to deal with the issue and what breaks my heart with that is because the thing is this is that most kids that are diagnosed with add they don't even have add it's called right. an ex it's called an expressive personality right Absolutely. It, 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 it's easy to put a label on somebody because it's easy just to give somebody a drug and and i have this conversation all the time and i'm not one of those that's real how can i say it i'm, I'm going to be candid about it right i'm not being negative sure. but i'm being i'm being candid yeah. Like there's a there, there, there's a cure out there for breast cancer. My wife just came out of, of out of breast cancer. Her journey for four years. There's a cure out there, but they won't release it because why? Because the month of October is a ten billion dollar month of revenue for pharmaceuticals for NFL. Mm -hmm. Everybody's involved in it now, right? It's it's a money maker. Yep. And once yep. the world finds out that there's a money maker, let's keep it going. And then you talk about attention to disorder. I teach this to. To, ta to teachers, to counselors. It's like when I go in there and do the personality training, I talk about this very thing because, you know, you have four basic personalities. You have your, you have your, your factual buyer, which is your emerald. Then you have your ruby, which is your driver to go get it done. You have your expressive, which is me and, as, and a sapphire. Then you have your pearl, which is that introvert, that amiable personality. And the ones that they label as, as, as ADD is usually the expressive personality because we weren't designed right. to sit at a cubicle all day. We weren't designed right. to sit at a desk all day, but we're, we're trained by society to stand in line, not move, not talk. We're put in an education system where we're not allowed to be who we're created to be. And I'm not knocking it, but it, there's definitely room for improvement. But what breaks my heart is when you have a, a child that comes up in it and all of a sudden... I'm a talker. I mean, that's who you are, right? Yeah. I'm, I, look, right. I'm wearing I'm wearing yellow. What Mexican wears yellow, right? But I'm just my personality. <laughs> I, it's like it's who I am. But 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 we want to give somebody a pill, whether it's a guy or a girl, and 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 it's a date him because I saw my nephew go through this, and then that's the first thing, right? You're giving this false identity of oh crap, there's a problem with me, and then like what happened to your son? And thank you for just opening your heart to talking about this. Mm -hmm. It's like. Now there's like something, now you're questioning, was there something wrong with me? Is there something else wrong with me? What else is wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And that, that's what breaks my heart because I'm not, I mean, there's great doctors out there just the way there's great everything, right? There's always great people in every, in, in every profession, but it breaks my heart to some of those doctors that just are quick to write a prescription when they, they know in their heart that that's not the best solution for the problem. You know, Daniel, my, in my book, um, this one's for you, an inspirational journey through addiction, death, and meaning, and I'll find a copy later on here somewhere. Um, in my book, I talk about in the 90s uh, when doctors uh, started diagnosing ADD, actually back in the 80s and even the 70s, um, heavily, they, Ritalin was kind of the drug of choice. That, that's what was prescribed. And I'm not sure what the exact year, but this was 20, 30 years ago. There was about 600,000 prescriptions of Ritalin that were given to kids for ADD. And then 10 years later, so just one decade. So the kids aren't that much different, right? Over 10 years, kids are kids. It went from 600,000 to 3.5 million prescriptions of Ritalin. Now, you, you tell me, is the problem with the kids or is the problem with the actual diagnosis and the prescription element of this whole thing? How do you go from 600,000 to 3.5 million over a decade when I will venture to guess those kids are pretty much the same kids? They're not any different. Well, I, I would say there's two parts of that, right? It's, it's definitely part of the, the doctors doing that. But I, I, know, I know this for a fact because I have a, one of my nephews works for a, a huge pharmaceutical company out of, out of um, Dallas, Texas. And I can tell you that they're pushed, and I'm going to say the word pushed, to hit a quota. Mm -hmm. You got to sell those yeah. drugs, man. And we joke mm -hmm. about it, right? I said, hey, how you doing, son? He goes, oh, I'm doing great, man. He goes, guess what? Yeah, he goes, I'm pushing those drugs. And he jokes about it, but it's like they tolerate it because it's a good paying job, but they're pushed, to, they're pushed to sell these drugs, these pharmaceuticals. And I call them drugs because the thing is this, is we focus so much on the legal aspect of, of marijuana and cocaine. We focus on these things. But the reality is this, is that pharmaceuticals are killing more people than cocaine is. True fact. Right. It's a true fact. Right. So... To answer your question, there's there, there's two parts to it. A, it's the doctors that are writing the, the pharmaceuticals, I mean, that, that are writing the prescriptions, but B, 
there is some some bonuses behind her for them and pressure from the pharmaceuticals to the reps to sell these 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 drugs. That's what they are. These drugs to the to the doctors and they go on to prescribe them because the more they prescribe, the bigger the bonus they get. The more the sales rep sells from the pharmaceutical company, the more money they make. So it, it, unfortunately, the motive is wrong, Jeff. I guess is what I'm getting at, which which really sucks. And I'm going to use the word sucks because it does because it's yeah it's costing people's lives. Yeah. Um. I don't have a lot of boundaries on this show. I, I, I really wanted to be authentic and raw. So um, uh, speak your mind. That's what this is about. You know, one thing I learned about this, Daniel, is when Seth died, you know, they found him in a seedy hotel room, just like you would expect in the movies, slumped over in his chair, you know, his, his bed, his arms crossed. Um, try to refrain from being too specific, but I cover all this in my book. Um, he never even made it to his bed. So... The, the poison in his veins, as I like to say, prohibited him from just the, the sheer short moments of just laying down in his bed. He never even made it out of his chair. And immediately, I went into, I'm going to find every drug dealer out there and destroy their lives. I'm going to take every drug off the street. I'm going to go to Mexico and fight the drug cartels. And I realized, you know what, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> I'm going to live about a day. You know, that's not, that's not going to do anything. So to me, it came down to a supply versus demand issue. So I can fight the supply. I can go out there and try to do what I can, change the laws, all this stuff. Probably end up doing nothing other than killing myself. Or I could spend the rest of my life on the demand side. Changing the mindset with specifically children. And for me, it's the age of first use, which is 14 in the United States. So how can I get in to rewire the mind for kids and get them to resist bad ideas so we can lower the demand. And so here we are with 14,000 treatment centers, throwing medicine, throwing pills, throwing uh, all these rehab and recovery centers where the real emphasis, the true aim for this ought to be on the kids. That's where we need to spend a decade at to fix where we're going because I think just Adding another rehab facility isn't where I can add value in my life, Daniel. I think coming up with ways, whether they're online platforms or motivational speaking or whatever it is, um, where we can get to the kids and spend a decade, sleeves rolled up, in the trenches, understanding their why, not lecturing them, teaching them how to think. I think that's... I, I love what you're saying, and, and I, I want to. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I this comes to no, no. You're good. Is, you're good. Is, is is we have to, we have to give them a purpose. But I'll tell you what's happening, and I, and, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna reference back when the Berlin Wall came down. Mm-hmm. The Berlin Wall came down, and all the Soviet men lost their identity. They lost their purpose of what they stood for. They turned to alcoholism, drugs, overdose, same thing that we're talking about now. And unfortunately, the same thing's going on in our country right now to where, you know, people are losing their jobs, men and women. And, and we'll just say men because we reference men for the burden of law. We see some of these men in our lives have no direction. They feel lost because of, right, 2020 was an amazing year where Things just got mm-hmm. shuffled around and people lost purpose. People lost their identity. And then you have the kids that, right? The kids only going to realize who they are by what they see when they're young. So they're being mm-hmm. taught this, this lifestyle. And unfortunately, everybody was locked up in lockdown. And many people just, they got depressed. They got sad and they turned mm-hmm. to alcohol. And then the kids see this. And all the kid's going to do is, is turn to that. But I say that then they go to the doctor for help and instead of really helping them, they put a bandaid on it. And, and I love what you're saying because th- there needs to be another voice out there. That's why I, when, what I do is even though I'm a big corporate trainer, big keynote speaker, I go back to I still go back to high school. I still go back to middle school. I go back to elementary schools because I know that I'm not that that's where the kids need it the most. And we partner with a, a corporate sponsor that, that pays a part of our keynote and we go and we give three keynotes a month because they need to hear that, that voice of hope, right? They need to hear that voice of hope because even right mm-hmm. now in our great country of America, it's still great. There's despair at home because you have a, a, a mom or a dad that lost their job. And guess what? Unfortunately, 
they're being reactive and they're taking out their frustrations on their children and their children are thinking, man, there must, the doctor's saying something's wrong with me. I come home and then my mom and dad are yelling at me or one of them is yelling at right. me. And then they have that sense of false identity. They don't know who the heck they are. And guess what? It's easy. It's easy for a predator or somebody to come in and say, hey, man, you need some direction. Because think about this. It, it boils down to this, Jeff. As human beings, we all want to belong to something. And if we don't feel like we belong to our family or we don't belong to that, we're going to find a, a, a tribe, a group of people right. that we feel like we belong to. And unfortunately, many times it's, it's, it's those people that are associated with those activities as far as drugs and stuff like that. I, I hate to say it, but it just, it's, it's, it's the reality. Hey, tell me about the Daniel Gomez Inspire Show. Um, it's something that I, I, uh, I'm interested to hear about your show, kind of what type of people you're looking for as guests, and um, maybe some impactful stories that you have to share uh, with uh, the, the, the viewers today on uh, people that you've talked to, talked to on your show. Yeah, well, the Daniel Gomez Inspire Show, it's, it, it, it was born out of, out of 2020. When the whole country closed down, God put it in my heart, start your podcast. And I was like, it, it, no matter how much success we have, Jeff, I think we all go through this. We're like, man, who's going to listen to my show? But the thing is this is I, ha I had been practicing, Jeff. I had been practicing behind the scenes. The very mic that I'm using still today, I had been talking and doing it. But it just it came to, to the point where God said, start it. But I did it in spite of fear. I did it in spite of being scared. And I think mm. so many people, maybe you're listening to this right now and, and you want to try something new, but you're scared. Act in spite of, act in spite of being scared. There's, there's excellence inside of you, right? And the Daniel Gomez Inspire Show, we talk about life. We talk about business. We talk about entrepreneurship. Those are the three categories that we really talk about. And, and the thing is this is that when, when we start this journey of entrepreneurship, when we start this journey about becoming a business owner, it's just it, it's, it's a journey of becoming. And so many people were stuck in, in, in a phase of our lives that we don't want to let go of it. it. It's time to let go and release those past struggles, release those past failures. Because just because we fail, Jeff, doesn't make us a failure. Just because we make mistakes right. doesn't make us a mistake. But as you start this journey of becoming, it's beautiful when guests come on and, and they really just inspire me to really just take my life and my business to another level. And that's what the Daniel Gomez Inspire Show is to really inspire you just in life or in business because this is the reality. If, if you're a small business owner and you have 100 people or less just as a, as a, as, as, as a point of reference and the leader is, is not inspired and he's a micromanager, guess what? The business is not going to do as good yeah. as it should. So if right. I can inspire the leaders, if I can inspire the VPs, if I can inspire the solopreneurs, the, the mompreneurs, all types of preneurs out there, then guess what? If I inspire the, the, head, of the, the head of it, guess the, the business will be impacted. And that's where most people miss it because they try to focus on the tactics. And I believe me, you need strategies. You need, you need processes in place. I get that. But the main thing is you need somebody who's on fire as a business owner that's going to ignite that passion, that vision. So many of us, we perish because lack of vision. You need a vision for your life. Right. You need a vision for your business. So that's what the Daniel Gomez Inspire Show does for you, Jeff. Well, I'm happy you brought up the word fear because I just wrote about this this week on a blog I'm going to be posting because I think the issue with fear is, well, first of all, we step back to changing behavior. And you know this, Daniel, as well as anybody. There's really two ways you change behavior. I, I'm in the investment business, so... I'm, I'm retired from my wealth management firm. I started when I was 23. My son died. I, I pulled back and, and now I pretty much do the Living Undeterred project. But when I talked to clients back in the day about changing behavior, there was two ways that you could do it. You could inspire or you could scare. So if you look at whatever, whatever behavior you're trying to change, you can either use fear and, and, and scare people to make a change. Well, that, that's not permanent. You know, that people will do things until you leave the room and then they'll go back to who they are or you can inspire them and that's what your show is about pulling out the inspirational parts of people um, focus on the good things not the bad and so for me and this is a great quote I heard from somebody and I'm actually gonna incorporate this in another blog I have coming but fear is not a weakness it's a compass and I see a lot of motivational speakers a lot of life coaches that are saying be fearless you know be unafraid you know, fight fear. And I'm like, well, you're fighting upstream against a current that's, that's going downstream. If you try to fight it, why not embrace it? Make it, make it part 
absorb it into your into your um, into your daily framework and embrace fear. Don't 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 live fearless because in a way that if it's haphazard and you're not careful, you know, fearless could be jumping out of an airplane and, and hoping that your parachute opens. You know, hey, I'm fearless. It's going to open. Well, it may not. So I think I think we got to be careful as people that are trying to inspire people to tell people to live fearlessly. I think that's that's a, that's a that's a I'm not sure if that's the route I want to go when I'm talking to people. How do you how do you feel about the word fear? How, how do you use it to inspire people? Well, I, I love the word fear. You know why? Because it's it definitely when, when I sense fear, it tells me that I'm going the right direction. <laughs> mm-hmm. Think about this. Fear means you're getting out of your comfort zone. Fear means that you're growing. Fear means that, hey, I'm onto something here. Because if you didn't have any fear, we all have fear. It's, it's a human, right? It, it, people say, right, kill fear and fearless. It's, it's everybody. Right. You know why everybody says it? Because everybody says it. <laughs> that, that, that's the dumb thing. Exactly. Everybody says it because everybody exactly. says it. But, but for me, exactly. right, fear, <laughs> fear tells you that, hey, I'm onto something bigger than, what, than myself. Fear tells me that I'm going down the right road because the moment we started having live events here in San Antonio, yeah, there was a little bit of fear, but it's acting in spite of that fear, right. it's acting being, in spite of being scared. And then last year, like I said, when the Daniel Gomez Inspire Show was launched, then we started the Sticker Shock Speaking Academy live events in San Antonio, Texas. We had over 20 speakers come live to our Sticker Shock Speaking Academy here in San Antonio. When that idea came, I said, man. I was, there was some fear. It was like, I had never done it before. So it's normal. I think too many right. people, they, they try to make it bigger than what it is. And it's just like an emotion, right? You feel sad. Hey, guess what? What do you got to do to get out of that feeling? You feel happy? Great. Feel it. So fear is an emotion that tells me, and I think it, people need to have that, right? They need to have a cognitive reframing that whenever you sense fear, that means you're onto something bigger than what you realize, which is a great thing. Mm. You're onto something great because fear, right, is when you're getting out of fear comes up when you're getting out of your comfort zone and you're in, and it's on that journey of becoming. So I agree with you on that. Embrace the fear. I say that embrace the fear. But the thing is, this is so many people when they get that idea, they get that inclination, they get that for that moment when they get that prompting when when fear controls you, that's where it's a bad thing, because in reality, fear is a great thing. Fear is good. Because fear, like I said, it tells you I'm headed to something great. I'm into something bigger than what I thought. But too too many of us, we get that fear and then we just, we freeze and nothing ever happens to that. And those dreams, those ideas, they go with us because we don't do anything with them. They they end up passing away because what you don't feed, right? Think about this. What you feed is going to grow. What you water is going to grow. What you you lack to water Mm -hmm. is going to die eventually. I, I like that. Um, back in the day when I was building my investment company up, I had a quote um, that said, uh, green, you grow, ripe, you rot. And that was something that I took with me uh, when I decided to retire a few years back, that I could just be ripe, you know, take the money that I made in my company, go buy some place on a beach and just start dying. Or I could write a book, start a living undeterred project, start a nonprofit. My nonprofit's called the Choices Network and we try to help kids make better choices. Um, we just had our, our golf outing last week, last weekend, and the Cedar Rapids community here, Daniel, was absolutely phenomenal. Not only is COVID hard to go around and ask small businesses for money, but you're probably not aware, but we got hit last August here with something called a derecho and it was probably the single worst natural disaster next to the flood in 08 that wiped out our community. We had, I don't know what it was, 180 mile an hour uh, uh, straight line winds for 45 minutes or it was 120. I don't know what it was, but we just got, our town got devastated. It was hurricane level winds for 45 straight minutes and it was no tornado. So this was not a tornadic type storm. It was a once in a gener- or a hundred year storm. And so here I am, you know, going out, knocking on doors. People haven't even got their insurance checks yet to fit their, fi- fix their roofs and to replace the furniture damaged in their bu- buildings. And I'm asking for donations. We raised close to gross about $23,000, dollars in four months from Cedar Rapidians that were able to give money and time to something that 
you know, was four months ago was just kind of an idea. So that just tells you the testimonial, the, the, the true awesomeness of human beings when you have a yes. vision. Yes. You, you know? And, well, you know what, you know, you know Matt, what that, that says is because, it's like I said earlier, we all want to belong. We all want to belong to something bigger than us. We all want to belong to something greater, to something amazing. And, and it doesn't surprise me that your city did that. First of all, it's an amazing community to come together. But think about this. When, whenever I feel down, whenever I feel just like yesterday was one of those days. One of those, it just happened to be one of those days when you're kind of in that, in that little rut that you're in. And what do I do? I, I call people, pray with them, or I try to give somebody a word of encouragement. That's not even, of course, my clients, but just people in general. And, and what you're saying right there, Jeff, is that people want to belong to something better. And when somebody is down, those people that gave that 23, 24,000, they're amazing because they, they know the truth that, guess what? To be blessed, you got to be a blessing. And why not bless Jeff exactly with what you've been through? And, and I honor you for just taking action and having the courage, right? Because talking about fear, there a while ago, most people would have had fear said, ah, oh, what are they going to think of me? They're going to judge me. But no. You acted in spite of that, and you were able to raise money for what you believe in. And if most people were to do what you did, think about how great our country would be right now. Oh, man. Isn't that so true? I mean, if, if one person in the middle of the, the country, in, in the middle of Iowa, can have a, a why, you know, that's something I talk about a lot. You know, what, what is your why? We all, we all have, you have a reason why you're doing what you're doing. I have a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. There's probably a lot of overlap. My why is very simple, and I'm going to lead into ask you this question to you, Daniel. Um, my why is myself first, because if I'm not of sound mind and body, I cannot help anyone else around me. So for selfishly, for selfish reasons, not financial, but for selfish reasons, I'm doing all this for Jeff Johnston, because I don't want to join my son yet. I'm not ready to join him. Um, secondly is to honor Seth. And third is to help others in that order. If I'm out helping others, Daniel, and my personal life is crumbling, I'm no good to anybody. So for me, it was reverse engineering my life and to say, hey, I got to take care of Jeff Johnston first. I lost a marriage, Daniel. A, a 20 a twenty year marriage came to an end. Before my son died, my marriage was a 10 out of 10. My wife and I had a beautiful marriage, traveled the world, three beautiful kids, big house, successful company. One moment. 6.30 a.m. October 4th, 2016, I get a call that my son's dead. Within two years, my marriage is over. Uh, I was an alcoholic. I was a compulsive gambler. Um, I quit drinking alcohol December 24th, 2017, 14 months after Seth died. In my book, I talk about how I did it, and it became the easiest thing I've ever done in my life as an alcoholic because I found my why. That's, that's, that was the niche. That was the, the sweet spot. So Daniel, you, you tried to commit suicide at a young age. Um, what's your why? What, what, why do you do what you do? You know, now I, I, as, as I got older, my why definitely shifted. I think in life, your, your purpose changes. And I think when I was in my 20s and my 30s, it was all about being ambitious and a mighty dollar, right? Providing for, providing monetary for your family, which work right. we want to do for our family. That was my drive when I was younger. And now these past four years, my why shifted to, right? I do it to spend time with my family. Hmm. Yep. That's my why. Nothing brings me great kids, joy. Yeah. I have three beautiful kids and before I would buy them a Jeep before I'd give them the latest iPhone. And in reality, it was cool. They loved it, but all they wanted was their old man. All they wanted to do was spend time with dad. And right. I can tell you that so many times, even when I started my business four years ago, my son would walk in and think of, and God showed me this, right? He goes, think about the effort it took your, your son or your family to get off the car, walk up the stairs to your office, because at our old house, my office was upstairs, knock on your door, like it took effort. And as soon as they come in, you brush them off because you're here and you're, you're, you're working. And I would literally say that, yeah. I'm busy, I'm working right now. Right. And so I shifted that. And my wife pulled me aside, right? And granted, she's going through her breast cancer journey. She had a double mastectomy. So this is during the, her first year. She goes, you know, maybe you just need to be more considerate when people come into your office. But I was, I was changing, right? I was growing as a journey of becoming. And, I, and she said, remember why you started this business? 
But of course, we don't change overnight. We got to let go. We have to unlearn a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that doesn't serve us. So as that first year, believe me, I unlearned a lot of things, Jeff. And the one thing that I really learned and I really grasped is my why is I'm doing it for A, for my family is, is the main reason is my wife is my inspiration and my kids. You know, there was a lot of healing that had to take place for, for, my, for my family. And just now, four years later that we've been, we've had some great success. It's my son gets home in March for spring break and he's like, hey, dad, what are you doing? I embrace him. And he goes, hey, man, let's go to the lake. I'm like, let's go, right? I'm looking at my schedule and well, I can move this, I can move that. And that's what it's about. It's, it's my why is my family for me. And, and the reason I bust my butt is guess what? If, if we need all, if they don't have the money to go on vacation, guess what? Dad has it. And it's not about the yeah. money, but it's about the time that you spend with them and the guidance that you give them. And just the fact that when I started my business and we won podcast of the year, we took off with our, right? My, my book, you were born to fly, became international bestseller. Well, that aspires them to be even better. And I didn't graduate from college. I didn't have a four year degree, but my kids mm. do. <laughs> and that's what it's about, <laughs> right? That's what it's about. Right. My daughter's, my daughter's going to be graduating for, with her MBA. And, you know, I, I applaud her. I support her. I celebrate her. But I don't have those aspirations because I, I have a business mindset and that's where I focus my education and my growth. But the fact that they're doing this, I know that God is preparing them for even more success than I could ever, ever, ever want for them because of the fact that, guess what? Dad at 44 years old, he left a quarter million dollar a year job and he started his business from nothing. And by the grace of God, making God my CEO, look at where we're at now. And we just moved into one of our dream homes and... I listened to a, an, a podcast episode yesterday too, and I want somebody to hear this right now. It's okay to dream bigger. As I listened to that episode yesterday, I told my wife, you know, I like this house, but why not have a house on the lake too? Why yeah. not? If we're right. going to use it to, to help people out and to come and, because I'll, I'll tell you this, Jeff, what we don't realize is, it, and I'm pretty sure you're, you, you, you know, you've been very successful yourself, but when you put yourself in proximity and associations with people that, that, are, that are living a higher level than you, right. and, and, and I was able to be on a jet with one of my friends or one of my coaches, and then he takes me to the penthouse of this hotel. If I would have never experienced that, mm -hmm. how do I know what I would want? But just right. to show people, right, when they come into a different level of proximity, it, gives, it helps them to dream. And so many kids right now, they don't know how to dream, Jeff. And that's what I love what you're doing them. In, in some way, some form, you're showing them how to dream. Because if there's no dream, you're going to pass away. You lose that purpose. You lose your why, like you're saying. That's what it is. So if I can give my audience a vision of what's possible, whether it's through a Facebook post or through an Instagram post or through listening to a podcast or if I go speak to the United States Air Force, which I've done, and I can inspire the military to say, it's okay to show your feelings. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That's what it's about is inspiring others to know that there's more inside of them than what they realize is there, Jeff. It, that's an awesome, uh, and I was going to segue into your book because before we end the show, I want you to talk a little bit about your book. Uh, you were born to fly. It's a book you wrote in 2018. But one thing that I, um, I admire about what you're doing and anybody that's been through something traumatic is the vulnerability aspect of healing and when i know when i went through what many would consider the the ultimate pain is is you know i wrote something uh, i heard this the other day someone said losing losing a parent is losing the past losing a spouse is losing the current losing a child is losing the future and that just resonated with me because you know at 23 seth would have been 27 this year and um, after he died, we found out his girlfriend was, uh, was pregnant and he has a, a daughter. And um, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it took me some time to actually uh, to welcome the opportunity of her in my life. And this weekend, she stayed over for the second time. She's four years old now, and her name's Brighton. And 
Boy, if I can't find a why out of this, Daniel, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> you know, I, I got I got this beautiful little girl that her dad is dead and her mom is in jail or prison for heroin and lost custody. She's four and she has already some massive strikes against her. But I tell you what, brother, this will be her competitive advantage. I will make sure on my last breath that she will never use this as an excuse to crumble. This will be what sets her apart. This will be her why as she gets older. So she can live and honor her dad, but live for the living. And that is a key part of my journey is I honor Seth, but I sure in heck am not going to let his death be my undoing. And, and that's, that is, to me, the beauty of trauma. The beauty of adversity is that you have two roads. And it's a chapter in my book. You have two roads to go down. And I'll, I'll tell you this quick story, Daniel, that I want to ask you about your book. The day my son died, I got home. We were going to a golf tournament and I got home to, I had to tell my wife that our son was dead, which was the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. Yet I knew in the back of my head, his two little brothers were going to be home soon. And I had to tell them. How was I going to do this? I had one chance to mess this up. I had one chance to lose the opportunity to have the greatest life lesson I possibly could have given to me. And that's the teacher of death. And I told myself this, this, and it popped in my head. I sat my boys down. I said, you know, boys, we have two roads to go down. We have one road of inspiration, motivation. We have one road of anger, despair, and hatred. I'm taking the first road. You boys can join me. So Daniel, the key thing for me is I didn't, I didn't want to tell them how to grieve. I didn't want to tell them what to do. I wanted to show them as a man, as their dad as a human being, how I was going to do this. And boy, what they've done, both of them have been, I couldn't even tell you. My, my oldest son, my oldest son, Ian over here, or my middle son, he's yeah. a division one golf. He's a division one golfer at South Dakota. He's raised $45,000 through golf to benefit alcohol and substance abuse for kids. Uh, he was named the Jerry Cole sportsman of the year award through the American junior golf association. They picked one male or female golfer in the entire world. And he won it. And my point is, isn't to brag about my son. My point is to brag about the resiliency of the human soul is to put on, on, on offer for people to see that no matter what happens to you, and I'm sure you do this in all your speaking engagements, you can become a better person, not a bitter person. You must, yes. you must, because if you don't, it'll destroy well, you from within. It goes back to what you said. When you write, you rot. When you're green, you grow. Mm -hmm. And when you write, you allow that bitterness to set in and it ripes you. It kills you from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And when you're growing, you embrace that adversity and it grows you into the person that you were meant to be. You see, the journey of life is amazing. The journey of life is going to teach you some valuable lessons. But it only teaches you the lessons because... That's what's going to help you to live to life to the fullest. The moment we really embrace this and you realize that it's happening for you and not to you. And when you realize that you don't have to take the victim mentality, you take the victor mentality. Hmm. That's where okay. that's where all your blessings come out of. Right. You know, one thing one thing I admire about my wife, she never said, why me? When she had breast cancer, she never said, why me? She said, why not me? Right. Why not me? And I've learned through watching my wife and just the journey that we've had these four years is the fact that whatever comes my way, I look at problems differently. And I hope your audience takes this away. I want them to write this down is problems give you the opportunity to show off your genius. Mm. Problems give you the opportunity to show off your strength. Problems give you the opportunity to show off your competency. That's all it is. And think about it. Mm -hmm. The reason we have wireless phones, why? These wireless phones right now, it was a problem because it was stuck on the wall. Somebody figured out a way to get it off the wall and they solved the problem. I want to carry a phone with me. Somebody had that idea and guess what? They became very successful. In, in, an inventor made millions and millions. Somebody had a problem with that. Somebody had a problem that, man, I'm recording the podcast or I'm doing this video and it, it sounds terrible. Let me invent some headphones and guess what? So the people that are going to succeed in life are the great problem solvers. So when you learn to embrace the challenges, when you learn to embrace the problems, 
It just helps you to be more creative. And I'll tell you, that approach has definitely helped me. Don't, don't get me wrong. When something happens or there's a mishap, I'm, 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 I'm human. I'm like, yeah. man, but I, re I realize <laughs> that, well, maybe this, maybe this part of my, maybe this, the, the swimming pool messed up because God's going to bring me somebody to pray for. Or maybe the, the, the faucet didn't mess up because a plumber needs to hear a word of encouragement. And that's the way I approach it now. It's when something, there's a mishap, that means that I'm destined to meet somebody new and that maybe God needs to give them a word of encouragement or let them know that they're loved. So that's the way. So for me, embrace the problems because it helps you to reveal your genius. That's what I would tell your audience right now. <laughs> tell me about your book, You Were Born to Fly. Uh, you wrote that in 2018. Um, and yeah. uh, tell, tell my viewers. Uh, right here, You Were can, Born to yeah. Fly. Daniel Gomez, tell me. You, were born for, you Were Born to Fly. You Were Born for Greatness. They can get it on Amazon. Uh, we have it in hard copy, paperback, and on, on Kindle version. But when I wrote You Were Born to Fly, I was really just in a season of my life where I had lost my identity, my confidence. I had lost who I was. And as I sat down to write this book, the first chapter, chapter one, is on confidence. Because I, I, I had to find my confidence. And God whispered to me, Jeff, I am your confidence. And when you have the confidence, you have the confidence to lead yourself. Because like you said earlier, a big part of what you do is because for you. Well, you have to lead yourself before you can lead others. So yep. this is an amazing book on personal growth, on building your confidence, on self-leadership. That's going to give you just practical, simple ideas that you can apply every single day that are going to help you in life and in business. Because this is the biggest, the biggest myth we've been told is this, is that... Alone we can do it. To, alone we can do it. No, when you, when when you reach out and you help other people, guess what? Together we go further. Together we go further. And to me, it's about a journey of going on a to flying with other people, letting them know that when like you referenced the parachute, that when they get to the edge of that plane and it's time to jump, they're not going to be scared to jump because they know that they're not alone. So when you were born to fly, when they read you were born to fly. They're, it's going to build their confidence, it's going to build their self-esteem, and they're going to know that they were born for more because nothing, nothing is worse than going through life and just surviving instead of thriving. Right. And not really living what you were created to be. You were born for greatness. You were born for success. You were born to fly. You weren't born <laughs> to be average. You weren't born to be average. You were born for greatness and to... This goes out to your audience right now. If no one's ever told you they believe in you, this is Daniel Gomez Inspire saying, I believe in you. Nothing is carved <laughs> in stone. You can change anything in life. You can change anything in life if you want to badly enough. The question is, how bad do you want it? So stop playing victim to your circumstances, to your situations, and embrace the challenges that come your way because those challenges are just a stepping stone to your excellence. They're a stepping stone to where you're going to take off and fly because there's nothing, 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 nothing in this world can stop a person with a made up mind. And once you make up your mind to do it, you're going to become unstoppable because you were born for that. You were born for greatness. You were born for excellence. I'm going to say that again. You were born. I will. Um, I'll put a plenty of links on all my social media platforms to get your book. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to read it myself. I will. I will tell you. One thing that I've learned from this journey, Daniel, is the concept of reframing. And I'm uh, back in college. I learned a lot about Stoicism, which is a Greek, an ancient Greek philosophy that encompasses the um, logic and reason and kind of reframing your situation. So when you talk about adversity and things like that, a lot of it is just um, how you can take a situation and then just reframe it. So I could take death, for example. So death enters your life, or in your case, you know, cancer. Cancer enters your life with your uh, with your wife, and you know obviously, cancer and death have elements that are uncontrollable. I mean, you know, I mean, I I couldn't have stopped my son from dying, but I certainly can control the amount of suffering that I'm going to inflict on myself. And so, reframing death as as opposed to looking at death or cancer as the worst thing that could have happened. I can't believe. Woe is me. You know, how am I going to survive? You know, blah, blah, blah. It seems like you, and what I've tried to do as well, is as the Stoics said, the obstacle is the way. The, the way to peace in my life is the obstacle. 
Not, not around it. I'm not going to go around death. I'm not going to go around cancer. I'm going to go right through it. And that's the quickest way to any anything you want to get to is your life is through, not around. And so I admire what you're doing. I, I'm excited. I'm happy we, we had a chance to do this today. Um, you know, maybe I know you got something coming up here in a few minutes, but uh, if I can grab you for about five more minutes, that would be great. Um, what's next for Daniel Gomez? Daniel Gomez, my goal is to speak to an audience of 100,000 people. I'm going to speak to an audience of 100,000 people because I'm going to transform their lives because my keynotes are transformational. And I say that with all humility because when the Spirit of God moves through me, hearts are changed and people are just moved. Because people need to understand that life was meant to be lived. So what's next for me is we're just going to continue to grow our brand. Daniel Gomez Inspires is, a, is, our, is my speaking brand with Daniel Gomez Inspires the show. Our coaching brand is, is doing phenomenal with Shield of Faith Coaching. We do a lot of executive coaching, a lot of business coaching. And it's just really an amazing platform that, that God's given us because I really believe in adding value to people. So with the services that we provide through our coaching, through our speaking, and now through our podcast launching, we help people launch their podcast. It's just amazing how as you step forward, it's really about, for me, what's really the overall picture is bringing hope, life, and inspiration to the marketplace right now, Jeff, because more people in the marketplace need some inspiration. They need to know that they're loved and they need to know this, that they matter. So that's my big mission in life as I continue forward. I'm happy, I'm happy you brought some of that up because this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. I know, I know our show isn't going to run until probably June or July just because of the fact, as your show is too, I have lots of shows pre-taped. But the month we're in right now is Mental Health Awareness Month. And one in five Americans, think about this, Daniel. So think of 10 people that you know. At minimum, two of them are experiencing some type of severe mental health issue at this point. Depression, anxiety, bipolar, suicidal ideation, alcoholism, drug addiction, whatever it could be, they all fall under the umbrella of mental health. And so what you're doing, what I'm doing, what all the other people out there on social media are, are, are doing is trying to reach those people at the highest risk, yet also try to get to some people that haven't experienced the you know, the, the, the stresses of life, and that would be the, the children, the 12, 13, 14-year-olds. I had someone ask me, well, Jeff, how soon do I start talking to my kids about this stuff? I don't know. What do you tell them, Daniel? You just you start at the age where they understand. It's never too young. You got to educate them. You got to guide them. And it all starts, right? It starts at the house. So I think as soon yeah. as they ask a question, I think so many times as, as parents, we receive a question that catches us off guard and we, we think, right? A good example is sex, the birds and the bees. We, well, let me know. We'll talk about it later. No, talk, if they're asking you a question, right. they're, they, they're, they're going to ask somebody else if we don't give them the answer that they think that what they, what they want. So just talk about it. Like I said, when we open up your, this, this interview is this season right now in life that we're in, as we go into the rest of this century, this decade is you got to stop. We got, we, we all have to stop living life shallow. We have to live deeper. So if, if a child comes and asks you, if a, a teenager comes and asks you a certain question, answer it, let them know. Why not let it come from you, their parent, their guardian, who they trust, then from a source oh, that's yeah. going to maybe influence them the wrong way. Yeah. I agree with that wholeheartedly. You know, I mean, that's one of the struggles we had with Seth Daniel is when he, even when he was in prison, um, I was the only one that visited him. All of his convenient friends that were smoking pot with him and stealing things and doing drugs and drinking, and they just moved on to other convenient friends. But there was dad putting money in his account, driving in to see him, you know, sitting in the lobby waiting, crying. Um, you know, the one person that he probably pushed back the hardest is the one person that was always there for him. And mom was as well. Um, so I guess the life lesson for me with children, a quick story, and then we'll wrap this up. But in my book, I talk about when my son, my youngest son, Roman, who's now 17, my boys were 13 and 15 when their older brother died. And sibling death is one of the hardest things to deal with, uh, more than losing a parent. 
losing a losing a brother or sister is tougher on an adolescent. And I sensed Roman was having problems, Daniel. I don't know if I don't know if you're like this, but I like to talk. I like to like solve problems by talking. And my son walks up. I go, Roman, what's going on? He goes, Well, uh, I want to talk to you about something. He walks up to me, puts his hand over my mouth, and said, Dad, don't talk. And I had to listen. And it was torturous, but I learned something from him. My son coming to me at, you know, 16 years old, putting his hand over my mouth, is that maybe sometimes it's best I just shut my mouth. And when kids come to me, when my kids come to me and want to talk about sex and drugs and alcohol and lying and all these things that they don't want to talk about, maybe it's best we don't talk as parents, right? Yes, just listen. Just listen. You're true. And thank you for having me on your show. It's been an amazing time. And what I want to do for your audience is they can text the word CONFIDENT to 26786. That's the word CONFIDENT. C-O-N-F-I-D-N-T to 26786 and I'll get them a free training, Seven Steps to Fly Daily. And I want to say thank you again, Jeff, for having me on your show. It's been an amazing time. They can find me on all my social media handles. Daniel Gomez Inspires is my brand and I would love to just add value wherever I can to any of your audience. So thank you for having me, my friend. You bet. And I, uh, I look forward to reciprocating this on your show as well. So um, I'm excited to get to, to have that opportunity. So thanks for being on the Living Undeterred podcast. And I have no doubt that you will love Undeterred. But I always tell everybody at the end of every show, live undeterred. <laughs> <laughs>